And welcome to episode 21 of the Coaches Show. We are live. I'm Coach Mike Bianca of the New Orleans Hurricanes with my co-host Ryan Gray, coach of AC Diesel. Tonight, we get an update on the ICPL from Chris Hudson and the WNXL from Haley Leva. But first, we have the honor to break down the WNXL finals with Coach Rich Adix of Dallas Vibe and the semi-pro final with Coach Devin Strickler of Royal City Sea Dogs. Yeah, it's going to be a fun episode, man. It was really uh, it was a lot of fun having SK on a couple of weeks ago and getting to do that one. And and um, you know, this is the stuff we've been wanting to do, right? Is is right. get other coaches in, break down games, talk about mentality, uh, strategy. You know, um, and then also, and we were kind of talking about this in the green room before the the show kicked off. Like hearing, you know, coaches kind of owning their own mistakes and understanding like, hey, these are the, the places I need to improve. And, you know, here's my plan going forward and things like that. So good stuff. Really excited. So tonight's episode is brought to you by Max Sportswear for all your custom paintball goods. Get maxed. So before we bring in our correspondence and get an update on the ICPL and the WNXL, we have some really exciting news from Major League Paintball. So yeah. Black Zebra Studios, uh, which is now Paintballers, uh, Paintballers and Major League Paintball have signed an agreement uh, for the video game that many of you saw at World Cup. Uh, they had a huge tent kind of right in the middle of the vendor area. They are now partnering and have signed a licensing agreement with Major League Paintball, and the game will now be called Major League Paintball 2024. So... They also are going to be a platinum sponsor for the entire rest of the year. And there will be a gaming tent set up uh, at every event moving forward. So you'll have opportunities to jump in, play the game, check it out. Uh, we have a really quick promotional video for you. So we'll show you that. Was there audio with that? So that's pretty rad, right? Yeah. Uh, one of the best parts about the game is on Wednesday when the field layout drops, you will be able to buy that field layout the night it drops and mm -hmm. play the on the layout with all your guys if you want to. Uh, so it's going to be a way, kind of a cheater code, if you will, to jump in and play the Play the layout before anybody else, of course. Uh, I was having this conversation with somebody earlier. Like, just because you see things in the video game doesn't mean you're going to be able to do those things yourself, right? That's so, absolutely correct. And, you know, obviously, you know, human, you know, setups of the Pythagorean theorem don't always match up or line up when we're at the, the events. But, uh, but it'd be a great way to field walk with your team, maybe work on some communication, so a lot of big things. Before we get going too much further, I want to send a shout out to Zachary Rush. He's in the chat room and Zachary owns a, a small podcast out of Louisiana by the name of uh, the Paintball Lounge. So thank you for joining us, Zachary. We appreciate it. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Was that the one you were just on? I was just on. He's he's. he's oh, fantastic. cool. He well, go check out the Paintball Lounge and listen to uh, Mike babble a bit. I babble very well. So I'm a babbler. All right. Well, let's bring on Chris Hudson and get a quick ICPL update. Before I do that, though, please go like uh, Black Zebra Studios on Instagram to keep up with all the, the up-to-date information and new things coming out about the game. Uh, there will be a ton of, of um, stuff coming over the next several weeks. So, uh, again, uh, Black Zebra Studios Instagram. Uh, go check them out. Awesome. Chris, hey, welcome. Chris, how are you? What's going on, guys? I uh, I feel like we've been a couple weeks from Vegas. I've, my brain's already moved on like most uh, Mech 10-man players onto the pro DNA and onto Dallas. So 
I, I have to step back in time a little bit to try to think about just how incredible Vegas was. Eight teams slugging it out on a massive field. And I think I told everybody, I kind of suspected it might have two giant snakes and have a giant <laughs> pyramid in the middle. It, it was exactly what we thought it was going to be. It was awesome, but it was extremely challenging. It was really a, a field that required a lot of creativity because most 10 man teams don't come stacked with four or five snake players ready to just hit the road and run. Uh, you're lucky if you can get two out wide and hopefully there's a two somewhere behind that one praying to God, the one doesn't die. Right. That <laughs> yeah. this field required you to have a bit more in the, in the depth chart to be able to accomplish it. Uh, kudos to Jason Trozen for putting together a really challenging field. Eight teams slugged it out. Chess club had a better showing than they did in the golden state open. They came in and, and, and showed up and played much, much better. Uh, the story that didn't make sense of the entire event for the Las Vegas ICPL was the misfits did not have a great showing. They came with a really good roster, just didn't, didn't pan out for them. Not really sure if they weren't getting the calls. Our general consensus on our 10 man field was that the refing was pretty on par, you know, kind of had its moments, but it was, it was pretty on par with what we'd expect from a 10 man ICPL mechanical event. Uh, the, the biggest kind of surprise was Louisville Simon. Those guys showed up and they punched people in the mouth the entire day. Uh, myself included was on the receiving end uh, a few times during the course of that event. Really fortunate that aftershock did indeed pulling out the, the event. I got to guess with them. It was a lot of fun playing with a, a ton of incredible guys. We, we played a couple other events during the course of the weekend and, it kind of gave us the, the ability to, to test some new things and feel some, some new things out on the field and work on some chemistry image though, was the, probably the, the scariest thing going into the 2024 season was the concept that image. Most of us would have hoped would have left 2023, the series champions and the Chicago windy city uh, classic winners. We would, we would have hoped they would have had kind of a, a slide a little bit, maybe, maybe have to rebuild. No, of course not. Richie Mau Mau, Fields an incredible team full of murderous mechanical killers. And <laughs> they, they, I mean, th th this is how 10 man works, right? Aftershock plays the, we, we came in, I want to say second seed. We played, um, or third, sorry, we, we came in third seed. We played image first. They smashed us. I mean, this is a 10 man mechanical paintball. This is when points matter. They smashed us. They left two bodies left on the field, grabbed the flag, made the hang. I, I honestly went into the second match personally kind of dejected thinking we were going to get, you know, put on the third place podium ring here pretty quick. We came out, we played Asylum really, really well. Opposite story. We had eight alive at the end of that, that second match. Now we're done. We just have to sit on our hands and watch as Asylum and Image take the field. There was no signs. I mean, zero signs from anybody watching that Image wasn't going to just murder everybody. Yeah, it didn't happen. Asylum came down the field in like two minutes and just blew them to pieces. And it was it was night and day from how they played us. So we smash them. They smash uh, our good friend's image and we walk away the champions. But by no stretch was it an easy event. Everybody had to earn it. Points mattered all the way to the end. And it was phenomenal, but it was a little hairy. It wasn't like Mexico where it was like rah, rah, rah. We, we win and it was easy. This was this was a battle, and the folks that were fielded by Todd Adamson for this squad all understood that you know there were some bigger things going on at the event, whether it was Aftershock playing on the pro field or Shock Kids doing really well, moving on onto Sunday on another field. A lot of irons in the fire, a lot of moving parts, a lot of logistics, a lot of pit crew challenges, things of that nature that made the weekend really, really challenging. The same guys all showed up the next day to play seven man mechanical, which is a feature of the NXL as well. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to tell you, I think it's one of the funnest events that Jason Trozen, and Tom Cole and the league put on because it's seven man mechanical on your layout. And I, yeah. I'll be honest, I didn't do my homework. I, I sat here. I've listened to you guys ad nauseum and I've rolled my eyes because I don't play that. It doesn't matter to me. I showed up thinking that he was going to make us play seven man on the 10 man layout. No. Seven man on your layout had to put two extra bodies and shoot mechanical weapons. And that was not, not an enjoyable day for me because I, I regretted immediately basically doing what I've done my whole life, which is try to not say Ryan Gray is right. And had I paid attention, <laughs> done a, a bit more homework, maybe I wouldn't have been in that case, but that is going to be the case for the rest of the season. I understand it. The seven man mechanical, which is not ICPL, but is a feature and an event at the NXL will be played on a five man layout. 
They're also going to have five-man mechanical at the next Dallas at NXL, which will be on the layout. Ten-man is always going to have a creative new feature, I understand it, and it, they are going to try to make it as challenging as what's going on on the actual layout. So we can see mm -hmm. some similarities, but some major big prop adjustments across, say, the 50 or something of that nature, or an extra in this case on both sides, there's basically an extra row of bunkers on the back line and we went kind of one through six you had six options across the back line which is crazy and it kind of looked like an hourglass and kind of funneled out so it got skinnier as you kind of went that way it was it was really unique re unique so we've got exciting things coming up the next event is pro dna the team count is through the roof i i think this is going to be a monster of an event i don't think other than the the pittsburgh open or maybe the badlands we're going to see the type of battle we see that goes down out there um in, in the pro dna and followed by that is going to be an event in portugal now portugal's only got four teams on the list so far uh that follows quickly after the pro dna and then on to the big one the dallas major there at cousins everybody's pretty pumped i don't think we'll see some of the teams again at some of the other affiliates i would suspect you won't see aftershock until the dallas major I would suspect you're probably not going to see Chess Club go for another one before the Dallas Major, given that they've just played two and kind of gone from eighth or seventh to fourth and are improving. But I don't think they're going to go burn the capital when they know they have a big major coming up. Misfits are going to have to try again. They don't have their points. If you don't have your, your 50 affiliate points or you don't have the next level down from that in second place, you've got to keep playing these affiliates till you get good scores so that when the double points event happens in Florida, you're not the one there holding the bag. You can do really well in Florida, but if you didn't do your job at the other events, it's not going to add up to a series title. It's not going to add up to a, a good day for you. Come, come the, the big show. Yeah. It's a points race. Good. Yeah. All right, Chris, thank you very much, my friend. No worries. You guys have a good one. It was good Thanks. seeing you there at uh, in Vegas, Chris. I, I had a blast. I like taking that photo with you guys. I yeah. thought that was great. I don't, I don't, I don't, there's one photo I don't like. I look like a short little munchkin in, in like the bosom of Ryan Gray. Yeah. I, I look, yeah. I'm like, hi, I, I show, I show my wife that. She's like, what were you doing? Yeah. I, was, I swear I was sober. You, you, know, I, you were I, nuzzling. I'm me. not going to tell you who yeah. said that, but someone did ask me, hey, who's the Oompa Loompa? Yeah. No, I, <laughs> I, I own that. I, I own that. I'll take that all day. This Oompa Loompa can still run and get low. So I'll, I'll there you that, go, yeah. baby. There you go. Hey, man. All thanks, right, guys. Thank, thank you. See ya. Oh, oh goodness I, gracious. I, I love his energy and I love the, you know, the detail he brings on his reports. That's fantastic. And he's fun because he's always talking with his hands. <laughs> I don't know he's like us. That. I'm just telling yeah. you. I don't know people like that. Yeah. I get it. I totally understand. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get Haley Levy. Hello, hey, Haley. Hi. That Hello. photo he was talking about is so funny because I started laughing too. Like, wasn't that the selfie? And he was just <laughs> like, kind of like, yeah, that was such a funny photo. It was. It was. So. Uh, anyway, that was obviously <laughs> from Vegas. Vegas was so such an exciting time. It was really cool at the Summit Awards, too, to see everyone all dressed up and us in such a big place with all the paintball people. But um, yeah. the WNXL side of things was super exciting in Vegas because now we have a full 10 teams. And I can say it certainly changed the dynamic of how things were in the previous years. And so completing the to the 10 teams, we added Tiki's Ohana, uh, San Francisco Sirens, and then the Suricados. And all of those teams had really good showings. Um, out of all of those, the Sirens did the best. And even me playing on the Cheetahs, whenever we played against them, they put up a really good fight. And no one really knows what to expect out of these newer teams because we haven't really played them before. All of the Sirens, uh, most of the girls used to be the Sacramento Diamonds um, in the first year. And so they they put up a good fight and it was a really good game. And they they did well, pretty like they didn't make it to Sunday, but they they did really good. And I could see them maybe making Sunday in one of these next events, too. But the teams that did make it on, which was uh, Vibe, Cheetahs, High Rollers and Heroines, um, High Rollers seeing their first Sunday, which I think is really cool because the High Rollers just entered the WNXL last year. And they got like pushed around a little bit, but even last year, I think they came out really strong. And so this year, like to, we, we played them in prelims too, and they looked really good. And so 
to see them move on and get one of those top four spots to go to Sunday was really exciting, honestly, to see, you know, it shows the overall growth of the league and where, you know, RW and XL portion of everything. So I think it's really cool that the high rollers made it on. And so um, beyond that, Dallas Vibe beat the Cheetahs and then the high rollers actually beat the heroines. And um, I would say an upset because, you know, everyone would think that the heroines would, you know, make it all the way to the finals. They have a really strong roster. And so, Again, like I said, the high rollers look really good and they they were playing super strong on this field. So they knocked out the high rollers, Vibe knocked out the Cheetahs. And so the finals matchup ended up being Dallas Vibe versus the high rollers. And so um, one thing that I'll say, like Dallas Vibe has experience in the finals. They've been there before. And I mean, it ended up showing because they ended up winning in overtime. And, you know, high rollers, it would have been cool to see them win just because they hadn't, you know, gone that far before. But it's still really cool to see that they made it that far and got second place. And it did go to overtime. So it wasn't just a blowout or anything either, which um, I mean, y'all are going to hear more about that match in a little bit from Rich. But yeah, we're going to break the whole thing down here. Just yeah, yeah. But it was super yeah. exciting. And to see a whole new dynamic of these newer teams kind of rocking the boat a little bit and you know, a newer team like the high rollers making it all the way to the finals. I think that's really cool. Yeah. It's really interesting. Layout played yeah. a lot into that. Haley, do you think the layout exactly? Was, uh, yeah. I think you're smart, Mike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I was going to say, you know, we had that happen in the, you know, on the men's side and the women's side where you had some, that's you know, right. with the, the uh, two new second place teams kind of coming in, uh, third and fourth were also new. Uh, I want to, I don't, it's always hard to talk about the Russians and say new, right. Cause they're not, but over the last couple of seasons, they haven't been there, but now, you know, with kind of a more chaotic, a little more scripted type layout, we saw some teams that, um, you wouldn't expect to be in those matches. I don't think many people expected the finals that we had in either division, um, you know, how much, like Mike said, you know, how much do you think the layout really, really played into that? I think it, it played into it a lot. And I think, I mean, we see it at every event. There's certain, like, I mean, a, a team should be good in any, any situation. Right. But there are times when totally. the layout just plays to as team's strengths, you know, if they have a lot of fast people or they have, you know, the right amount of shooters or the people who can do whatever. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they, high rollers do have a lot of like athletic and fast people. And for them, I think that benefited them because you, I mean, we all know how this, that field played. You had to have somebody like in the snake most of the time, or like you had to be pushing the aggression and, you know, I mean, there was ways to counter that, but you know, you, it was better to be that one person to, to have that aggressive person. And I do think they have that. And they also do like the people that they picked up, like Sobi and Alex are really good shooters. And so I think that also benefited them. So they had their fast front people. And then they also had the people who would stay in the back and to shoot off the break and do those kinds of things too. So I do think that that helped. I mean, it, it helped them obviously, but I think, I don't know. I think it would still do well on another layout, but this weird, crazy layout for sure. It, it worked for them. They made it work for, you know, for the way they played. Yeah. Great answer. Great <laughs> answer. Well, I, um, I think with the, the snake beam, the addition of all the snake beams, all the layouts this year may be a little bit chaotic and, and up tempo like that. So, um, you know, it's funny. We were talking at the event. I was like, Ryan Brand seems like the smartest guy on planet Earth. You know, he's got four snake guys. You know, he <laughs> seems like he's he's just made all the right decisions in the offseason and, you know, good on him. And, and it appears some of the teams in the W and XL have done the same thing, right? Have made this realization like we're going to need a lot more front players. You know, yeah, I chatted with Ryan about that very thing, and he says, "Well, when I saw that the addition was nothing but snake beams, I went, hmm, yeah, <laughs> right, <laughs> like, yeah. smart man." Mm -hmm. All right, Haley, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Haley. Be safe. Y'all too. Go Cougars. <laughs> so I just learned. Just uh, let me explain that. Um, so Houston Cougar, Cougars. Uh, so she had posted something that said, love being a Coug. And I couldn't help myself. I, I was like, okay, young lady, you're going to have to explain this to me. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, am I too old? It, 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 please explain this. Cause I'm, I, and she came and she goes, oh, it's, it's, it's short for Cougars. And I was like, okay, thanks. So it's a mascot. She's like, yes. I said, okay, my deductive reasoning did not fail me. Thank goodness. But I felt really old. Yeah. Well, 
So the next part, we're going to bring in uh, Rich Adix and we'll uh, talk a little bit. First, I kind of want to talk to Rich about, you know, the differences between coaching mm. men and coaching women and, and some of the challenges that he's kind of met in that process. And then mm. uh, we'll jump right into the match and, and break it down. Yeah. Welcome. Good evening, Rich. Good evening, guys. Hi, Mike. Hi, Ryan. Thanks again for having me. Absolutely. We appreciate you taking the time to come on and talk to us about this. We've got a lot of questions. Well, hopefully I can provide some insight and some good answers to, to you guys and um, new and aspiring coaches. That's yeah, the man. right attitude because listen, there are no right answers, right? We're making this up as we go, right? And there, and there are no <laughs> stupid questions. Let, let's be yeah, honest. Right. Here, right? There are stupid There's some. People. Yeah. yeah, there's some. <laughs> there's some. We get some silly ones from time to time, but yeah. Right. So I kind of mentioned before we brought you in, like you've been around the game a little bit. You've had opportunities to to spend a lot of time at Paintball Fit, where there's tons of teams out there. You've coached other teams. Um, you know, first of all, congratulations on the success uh, that you've experienced with with Dallas Vibe because they are. Um, I believe the winning is team in the WNXL at this point, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And in this, in that same time period have also experienced some pretty dramatic and e even kind of traumatic roster change, um, yeah. losing some of your season players, you know, a couple of years ago after the inaugural season and then kind of rolling into last year and then still ending up winning the world cup and then come in, uh, after again, some pretty big roster changes in the off season, uh, and still come in and win the first event. So, um, first, you know, what are the differences you found from coaching men and coaching women? First off, Ryan, thank you for the compliment. Um, and, and to kind of follow up with that, like Mike's preached before it's the culture, right? Mm -hmm. What, what's the culture? within the organization. And if you're able to manifest that culture and bringing it out to all the women that participate or whatever team you're playing with to make it consistent. Um, going, to, going to answer your question, the differences between like coaching men and women, I, I think the biggest is experience and time played. Um, because the WNXL is kind of a new thing supposedly where it's a field of their own, where women can compete against women. Um, it's a little bit different than when you're co-ed and you're mixing it in. Um, so that's one thing. Number two is physical ability. Um, it's not to say that women cannot do what men can do. They absolutely can. There is just fundamental things that men have a little bit more of an advantage of, but with the right time, with the right patience, with, with practice and consistency, they can execute just as well, if not better than many men in the sport. Um, mm -hmm. So it's breaking down some of those boundaries. Um, and then with newer players, it's conveying complex theories and making it simplified for many people to understand, basically being like an R2D2. <laughs> Star I love Wars that. Reference. I've been running into yeah, those a lot that. lately. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Um, those are those are primarily the two biggest issues, and and they're not really even issues. They're they're challenges, right? They're challenges that as a coach you have to embrace. You have to figure out how to tackle it on. Whether you go ahead and you ask other coaches. I've had the privilege of having numerous coaches around me and personnel around me that I can tap into those resources, right? The experience, asking Mike, asking Ryan, asking Casey. Um, there's just a wealth of knowledge out there and ways to handle certain situations. Just ask. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I do that for a living. I, I poke questions. I ask a bunch of questions in order to try to seek the answer or guide me towards the correct way to handle something. That's that's excellent. You and I have had some great uh, back and forth messages uh, on social media and uh, you ask some great questions. And and I'm one of those people that believes hey, I recognize my shortcomings. Mm -hmm. And I think when I recognize, hey, you know, maybe there's some other thoughts or theories or, or ideas about this. Ideation is so important in coaching and in what we're doing 
right? So yeah. going to another coach or going and just getting another perspective and doesn't even have to be another coach. It can be somebody in a specific, you know, type of business or work or what have you and say, Hey, here's my situation. Yeah. How would you handle this? How would you address this? What are ways that you would approach it? And that's smart. That's just smart. <laughs> you know, I used, I say this thing at all my, all my clinics. I say the dumbest question is the one not asked. Correct. And or the you, shot that's never been taken. There it is. You'll miss a hundred percent of the ones you don't take. So I, I'm not afraid of looking dumb. I, I am not. Oh, Gretzky. Yeah. There no. you go. Well, I, I, not, no, I will sit there and I will, if I'm not, I'm not embarrassed about that. If I don't know something I'm going to ask, or if yeah. I'm stumped, I'm going to ask. And I, I think that's the biggest thing for any new coaches or anybody that's looking to get into coaching. Just ask. I mean, there's, there's a plethora of knowledge out there. There's individuals like yourself, Ryan, Mike, that are willing and open to giving the advice out. There are really no secret recipes. It's just, are you willing to listen with both ears and, and speak? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So Christian Dallas Smith from in the pits podcast, he, he asked, uh, Rich, are you finding that the matches in the WNXL play similar to the men's matches in divisional pro, but at a different pace, or do you find that there's an entirely different meta when it comes to the WNXL? Great question, Christian. Mm -hmm. it, that's actually a really good question. Um, it can be both. Um, it depends on where the teams are practicing and who they're practicing against, right? Because you'll develop habitual habits and tendencies, right? So Texas paintball is a very zone heavy, intense paintball. It's not flashy like a Northeast or a West Coast where you got people making huge, big moves. Um, you look at a lot of the AC Dallas, um, AC Diesel programs that were that were down here in Texas, zone paintball, right? Um, you look at West Coast, you see some people that just have wheels, man, or even on the Northeast Coast, you know, trading out bodies and just digging it. So there's, I believe there's different styles and depending on where you train at, you kind of pick up some of those tendencies. Now, as far as speed and play, yes, there are absolute differences. I don't think what necessarily happens on the pro field in the men's pro division is exactly how a women's pro team is going to play it. And that's because of numerous factors. You're looking at experience, time played, physical capabilities, fundamentals, running and gunning, snap shooting, gun battle, and then last but not least, paintball IQ. Not to say that these women cannot match these men. Give it another five, 10 years. Totally. They'll be there. Yeah. Look at the men's league. The men's league has been established for years, years, where now the women, two years in the league of their own, where they're getting to play people of their own gender to be able to develop and promote and show off what it is that they can do without being assisted by another male on the field. It's, it's their fellow sister, their fellow girlfriend, whichever teammate. Yeah, it's great. It's great perspective. It really is. Um, and that's a great question, uh, Christian. That's, it's fascinating to me. It, how much does that, does that weigh into having coached other divisional male teams? How much does, um, that way into your your play calling hey i know this team is is weak here or strong here so we're gonna we're gonna change our game plan we're gonna go far we're gonna pocket up we're gonna do these different things oh, how much does that way into wh what you do heavily um so prior to being a, a being asked to be a head coach for dallas vibe and again i i, I thank the luke Howell family for giving me that ability i was brought in originally for scouting and statistics Right. I look for habitual natures. Um, my line of professional work, I'm a radiation safety officer and hazmat explosives guy. So oh, I look I look for fine details. Right. I look in regulatory details. So when I'm watching matches, I'm looking at, you know, hey, did Fedorov diving go in front of the bunker when he came up? Did he engage high, low, medium was his first three balls? So I look at these natures and it's just like when you go to the refrigerator to go grab your favorite can of soda. Are you using your left hand or your right hand? You don't think about it. It's just habitually built in, mm. right? Through tendencies. So I I scout, I've had, a, I've had players help scout with me to where we learn about some tendencies that teams have. And that's that does 
factor in some of our play calls or what we'll end up trying to do, whether we're going to go far, we're going to go short, play the pocket and not risk the body. Yeah. Um, but then it's also like you said, Mike, it's, if you got that one player, like I have, I have a girl, her name is Angie. She has a fire. She's spicy. She's like, just put me in. I just want to go feast. You know, and if she's feeling it, why, why pull somebody back from those restraints? Let them, you know, let them prove it. And then if, if, if they falter a little bit, then we can pull it back. Right. But sometimes if you've got a Ferrari, you just got to let it go. I think she says that in the, like in the match, <laughs> I think she, she says like, let, let me go eat. eat. Yeah, and and that's that's the other thing that I'm I'm truly fortunate with within the WNXL is I'm always at paintball fit. Um, I play for a divisional team uh, called Greed with Jason Bonner, so I'm always at the field with the women, working with them, messaging them individually, getting to know their personalities on what works in order to get that extra one percent to get me to the finals field. But in all actuality, these women are the ones that make me look good because they go on the field, they execute, and they do their job. We're just here to provide guidance and steer the ship. Well, let's kind of transition into this match, right? So uh, we need to kind of jump in. So as you're preparing to play the high rollers, again, a team that has not been this deep in an event, uh, shows up, plays really well. Um, what is your mindset going into this final match against them? So my mindset, looking beta, looking at the looking at the data and some of the video plays that I don't want them in the snake, right? We know that a majority of the points points won in this tournament were on snake side, and the reward was on snake side because if you got somebody down the snake, they're actually crossed the fifty line. If somebody was in the Doritos and got to that Dorito wedge, they're not even at the fifty mirror line, so they're not really in deep enemy territory, nor are the shots the greatest. So my strategic plan was keep them in the pocket, allow our individuals who are better gun battlers, a little bit more experienced to work our way into the snake and then take control, right? And then with the players that I have in place, right? I put the players in the right positions to do a job, right? Just like putting the right people in the bus to get to where you wanna go in your destination. If you don't have the right people, you're not gonna get the job done. And then um, you basically go for there and kind of see how the team responds to what it is we're doing. If they're not shooting anybody off the break, if they're not really pressuring us or making the attempt to get in to match us, I'm not going to change a lot of my stuff until it warrants it. Every once in a while, yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll rope a dope or throw in something that they're not expecting. But also, why change something that's already working? I find that the simpler you make it for people to digest and understand the less chances of error. Totally. Yeah. So let's jump into point one. Mm -hmm. So real quick for point one, we wanted to do a base play two at the home, two at the tap one, at, one at each tower. And for our snake player to play the little mini W and then work her way in. We wanted five alive because it's the finals match, right? You want five alive, find out where all the bodies are. The goal is to basically shoot the Dorito side tower player that's going to challenge my snake player in getting in. And once we get that kill off the rip, then it allows my snake player to relieve from a job and to go in. Interesting. It's uh, Tejeda that's your snake player, correct? Correct. And she's new. Yeah. yeah it, and I, I picked up on that. Tejeda does an excellent job here um, of basically applying pressure early. Mm -hmm. So what? we have we have our we had our players playing cross in the Aztecs because the Aztecs had on this layout the ability to stop snake side progression if they got into that little Dorito insert before they go into the beam. Right. So high rollers, they see her make the snake. Mm -hmm. So this is their counterplay here. Yeah, and that's um, what the heroines did to us. So right. we she's, realized that's the trap, but yep. it fails. Tejeda gets the snap on her and wins. And and once that happens, once that failed, it's like they didn't know how to contend with Tejeda's presence up there. No, and they their snake player ended up just focusing in on the inside, just keeping Tejeda from trying to wrap, 
which yeah. is that player right there. Mm -hmm. The one critique I would have is it takes uh, Paredes a, a little while to shorten the tandem line between Tur her and Tejeda because right now, look at um, the amount of guns that are on Tejeda. Correct. Paredes can come up there, take that ground, and if something happens to Tejeda's Paredes, you haven't lost any ground. No, and, and you can immediately fill in. Absolutely. Yeah. Paul yeah, Allen needs crap be up in the center, though, here soon. Um, but yeah, I kind of wonder that comes. was my big critique is – is this got too far apart? Right. She the needs. She, yeah, she should be up here, you know. Especially with that many guns on, she's got. She's got to understand that the there's at least two guns here. Uh, Paula Allen in here a moment gets gets crafty in the center, but somehow doesn't see the high rollers uh, snake player. No, I think that was um, just a miscommunication on the individual that released into the snake. Um, because we doubled up the can at the home, um, one of the players just probably missed it. See, here's what I was talking, and I, and yeah. I think Mike is, is saying the same thing. If she's already here, and, and when your front snake person, uh, when she died, you didn't give any space away, right? right? With her being all the way back here, you've lost all the space, and now she has to do all the work without that gun here and all the guns focused all the way up the field here. Right. Yeah. If the she's already issue. there. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say the other issue is this gives the high rollers an, an opportunity to counter. Now we give them totally. breathing room and yeah. Yeah. they didn't take advantage. I mean, they take the Dorito, but they don't, you know, because you have that center tower presence, that's what basically slows their roll, which was good. Mm -hmm. But this pressure could have been applied a lot sooner. Yeah, and and that to me comes with experience and more play time, right? Absolutely. Sure. Foresight after after watching this, every girl had homework to review the finals match. Boom. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, my favorite part of this point's coming up here in a minute. <laughs> so here she is. She's crawling, and I think that's Paula. So yep. you see that you can see the she literally sits up and she's looking in set so much. And mm -hmm. she misses the snake player right in front of her. And and we know that where that Dorito is, what matches the snake beam, that snake player can sneakily get in there if nobody's paying attention, especially if the home player at that time that was containing that, that was Paula's job. But when she goes down and she's on her belly, somebody else has to take that responsibility. Right. Yeah, a lot can happen while you're crawling. Yep. Yeah, see, these two are doing a great job. Like, that's exactly how that should look. Yep. Yeah. No, uh, having Corinne and Michaela were, was definitely um, an upgrade for us and to help hold down the zones. I mean, selfishly, um, you know, I'm sad Rand's not there, you know, just because she's an Oklahoma girl and plays plays at Avid a lot, the field right here by my house. But, um, Yeah. You guys played this well yeah so drew Banks. really the only mistake mis the, and he says really uh, the only mistake mistake was just not again if if uh say her last name for me the hot hater perez jc yeah what's her last name per uh, I've heard perez? It. yeah perez i thought is how it was pronounced i just call it <laughs> okay yeah oh, so if jc if yeah. she's already up Right, she can be on the cross and keep the other player from going into the snake. Right, yeah. while the middle, while that middle action is occurring, she could have. Uh, she could absolutely. Have that. Yeah, they would have never been able to feed that snake to counter your center push because she would have been on the inset while Tejeda's engaging the pressure. So yeah, so in that first point, we ended up shooting the Dorito, Dorito, Dorito side small Aztec. They kept to the pocket. We noticed that that one girl that could have left the W to go into the snake. She was just keyed up on the cross. So we, we maintained them in the pocket, but what we failed at doing was keeping them in a pocket and allowing that snake side tower individual to fill out and go into the snake. Yeah. So going into point two now, what is the message? So going into point two, I'm just going to run the same one, just based on the data that was just shown, right, on what they did that they already got one player shot out. So the question is going to be, is, is this player going to potentially run and gun? to their Aztec or are they going to just dive in 
and that allows me to have that free body to maybe take a little bit extra but it's the finals field we're still feeling it out so for the second point we're going for the same play no changes okay. same play same line same play same line the one thing that we did do make a small tweak was jc was supposed to ghost in that little zone right there to shoot right back up on on her cross shot and she ends up getting eliminated <laughs> okay so she was behind tejeda there on which would have been on our right hand side of the screen correct <clears throat> yeah and I'll say that was probably one of JC's first time getting shot out in the entire tournament. So, you know, whether, whether it was luck or whether, you know, they had a good gun. And you just lost, you just lost your, uh, your snake side, um, home player as well, I believe. I believe mm -hmm. so. And with the way this point shakes out. So rule of thumb for us is if you're already up on the first point, you know, and bodies are slowly dropping, you necessarily don't need to towel, you know, somebody oh, could be hit, they yeah. could be dirty, you know, good clock management. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know what happened there. No, I'm, I'm not conceding a five on three when I'm up one point and we're still, yeah. you know, still 10 minutes on the clock. No. Yeah. And, no, I want to, I, you want as much of that time to burn. Absolutely. Yeah. And we already had a stake presence again. We're, we were being the aggressor, right? We were, we were willing to get Tejeda in there. Is that Baird that just broke yeah, up? That, that's Corinne. So yeah. one of the things that nobody knows is during NXL prep weekend, she actually had her eardrum blown out. Hmm. So she was playing with one ear, one good ear. Um, and luckily the side that she was playing is the side she could hear out of. <laughs> well, that worked out. Yeah. It worked out in our favor on this one. So you've stalemated a little bit here now, but yes. here come. So high rollers are starting to push the the envelope a little bit on top side, but they have given you a free body, uh, just a bad death. Yeah, and that's a that's a kill from the cross side on Tejeda, just coming on the inside, and that's just inexperience. And after just talking to her about, you know, that's a tendency, right? If you yeah. watched any of the videos, majority of her first shots always came on the inside rather than going to the far outside and wrapping. Well, that situation, that use of that player from the high rollers here, where she goes to that center 50 and then posts up almost 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see that in the next, in, a, in one point that I remember. And it, it actually, after this. Awesome them because, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, she sits there shooting at nothing. Well, that's mean, so basically the high rollers had four guns in the, in the, in the fight. And, 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 and that's what and you were sitting with one waiting for something that was never going to manifest. Yeah. And, and that's what you risk. So this is the one point that I'm really critical of because um, I believe this is point three. This is where the girls get late to the box. It was either a chronoing issue, right? Yeah, I want to ask gun. how we do it. Why are we doing this? You know, I'll be honest. That's on my, that's on me yeah. and not realizing yeah not realizing or reading the rule book what is it what's the rule on at 20 seconds are you able to put a timeout or are you not able to put a timeout in on the yes. countdown no you can yeah, hit you a, can timeout. a timeout you can hit a timeout okay yeah. so for all you coaches out there you know that's important because you know this would have definitely been a, a a moment where i would have put in a timeout recuperate settled the nerves down from being a little bit frantic Okay. Yeah, totally. Because I can tell you, um, after watching this match now a couple of times, you should have lost. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you should have lost. Like you got pretty lucky. Um, you know, there there are a couple of situations that occur in the match. This being one of them, that you guys had a hundred percent control over. Um, and then, of course, the other, you know, high rollers getting a penalty, and then which we'll show in a minute. But. Um, yeah, this was one of those matches where it's like, hey, we won, but there are a lot of lessons here. Yeah. yeah. This is the turning point where, you know, giving up the second point, that's okay. But as a coach, pit staff, players, you have to be able to control that chaos. You have to be able to control those emotions in the pit 
and get your players focused. And I messed up in that in that moment. So, and this is what happens because of it. Well, you know, in, in the fact that you took accountability, that's outstanding. And and that's the thing, right? We've got to grow from that and recognize it. I, you know, I do feel like this ends up being a five on three mm-hmm. because of being late to the box and 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 kind of forcing an issue. But I also feel like the high rollers kind of squandered an opportunity here to really put totally. a pinch on vibe um, yeah, early totally. on the center player and one of their home players, they really could have taken advantage of this situation and they, they didn't recognize the situation. So we got a little bit, you know, you were, it, it's interesting. We'll, we'll watch this play out and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So you still make the snake, right? Um and I, I love this aggression. She knows, hey, let's get straight there and let's go to work. Totally. Um, yeah, no, she 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 understands the job. It's just, but but that that the fact that that yeah, she didn't miss. I didn't think so. No, she got mm-hmm. her in the face on that yeah. one. Um, but see now, what is she doing? She's she's kind of at a deep angle. Yeah, she's just. And I know trying she's to prevent- protecting the snake, but at this point, if you know, we can't let this person spread. Yeah. So, and I feel like the, the force multipliers coming from the home should be spreading out now. And okay. She's going to keep that controlled. So let's get out wide. Let's go. Let's yeah. get out wide and become the force multiplier out there. Well, and we're, we're sitting in that Aztec for the high rollers. We're not and there's really only one gun that's keeping her from doing anything. Yeah. She has one gun to beat. And honestly, she could go inside to that mini wall and then cut across. And now you guys are in a lot of trouble. Yep. And the reason I didn't blow this is we actually ended up do getting a kill. These are probably the three best gunfighters and highest IQ of my players out on the field. So I'm trusting them to try to see what they can do within a certain time frame to hopefully even it up, right? Make it a 3v4 or 3v3. But you'll see here that the center player and the top wedge player are doing the same job. Mm -hmm. And that's actually something you can notice throughout the entire match. And and so that allows you to spread. Correct. Right. So I think what happens is that that wedge player sees that the center player's got it locked down. Why is she not going aggressive on the far side? Yeah. So these are a couple of things that the high rollers made mistakes about. Yeah, that uh, probably should have made this point end a lot sooner than it did. Yeah, and I-, I think some of that too, though, that you're talking about, Mike, first time on the big stage, you know, in a finals match, there, there probably is a ton of nerves there, not wanting to be the one to make the mistake. And um, absolutely, so like, yeah, I'm seeing, so I kind of like, I get it, like, she should be able to see the person's gun in front of her and, and make a different decision. But man, I mean, you know, your guys were just there. Think about the emotions 100%. that are happening and, you know, the chaos of it. And, you know, what did you I've tell your, there, your guys? Right? Yeah. What did you tell your guys after? Right. Like you were yeah. right there and you could have grabbed it and held on. But yeah. yeah, I told the girls when they started this match, it's just another Sunday at fit. We've been here. We know what it's like with the crowd. You know, we know how to make our moves and take our spots. So at this point I was setting a rule every 30 seconds. I'm checking on the body count. I have somebody with, with fingers and everything, just letting me know. Um, for the record, I do I do want to state that this is this was actually more my my critique is more for the the high rollers. So sure. if they do watch yeah. this, they can come back and hopefully they're watching this tape as well and understand. Hey, here was here was an issue that we could have capitalized on, and now we're smarter from it. It wasn't me basically telling them, "Oh, you did that, that, this is what we could do better." So, yeah, no, no, no. I, I know what you're, you're not that guy. No, I'm, be, not, uh, I'm not. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're so not me. Right when I lost Paula at 508, that's All actually right. when I really should have toweled it. But for some reason, in that moment, outside of the net, in the pits, I was seeing something that was allowing me to try to go beyond the rules that were setting for myself because I saw, you know, I thought I saw a body drop off. Um, but again, this is a little bit of inexperience. I should have definitely toweled it to actually have an extra few minutes or seconds going into the next points. Yeah, I actually have that in my notes right here. 
Yeah. Why didn't you towel at 502? I, right. I have that as two. I, I had it. Why didn't you towel at 450? <laughs> because yeah. I, I always give that extra 10 seconds and I probably shouldn't, but I do that because it's usually like guys like Drew Bell or Stu or Daniel that are, and they're going to shoot somebody. I yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, so. You know, and, and it, it's probably me with a little bit of bias, right? Because I got, I have Michaela there. I have JC who, you know, is just coming off of a great World Cup performance that wants to go and win the point for us and, and do things. But yeah, I could have easily owned an extra minute, four seconds if I would have just toweled. Yeah. Yeah. So Jason Bonner saying, hey, I know you guys keep re reiterating how High Rollers are a new newer team, but they did pick up about four of the heroines, about four of the heroines. Is that like 3.5 heroines? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I will say yeah, that. So, oh, go ahead, Ryan. Go ahead. I was no, gonna I'm say just going to say, <laughs> go ahead, brother. <laughs> um, that regardless of the team, you always take them serious, you know, whether, sure. yeah. whether they're new or, or not. I mean, they're there for a reason. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I play every team like their dynasty. Yeah. And we play every team like it's the heroines because that's the biggest rivalry I know in the WNXL right now. Yeah, so you're going into point three, right? You guys have a chaotic box situation in point two. Uh, what's the mentality? What's the conversation in the pit before they go back on? So the conversation in the pit is more so with Snake's Eye with Angie on how she's feeling, the heat that she's getting. Um, the first three points, we played it short. We didn't go Snake off the rip. Um, and the only gun person that got shot off the break was JC, and that was due to um, – you know, a little bit of fault on her own, a misstep is what she ended up telling me. So I let, I let Angie to have a little bit of fun with it. Just, you know, go, go in for it. Now, hindsight, this is 0.4. I probably should have taken Angie sadder her and put in Mulaney um, to give her a little bit of rest. Cause one of the things I wasn't noticing is how much higher Angie was running in a, in her, um, to her primary bunker. Um, and then the other goal was to eventually allow Paula to shoot up into the center to apply a little bit more pressure and make something happen and potentially trade out with the other center player. Since we knew they were going to want to press the center to lock it up, because that's what I would do, right? And then um, some sort of a heavy cross response for not allowing our snake runner to go in. Made it. Mm -hmm. Nope, she got shot. Definitely looked at the ref like, well. And again, you know, everybody tried to key it up on Angie, but what a lot of people didn't know is that our D side was actually just as potent as our snake side. It just, it took a little bit more time to get going. Right. Now see that setup, you know, we, three and a half minutes on the clock. She's literally looking at a very specific portion of the field and there's been no call for it. I assume, um, I guess it, it is setting the trap and that's, mm -hmm. that's brave to do. Um, but that's literally taking a gun out of the fight for what well, we're going on on a minute now. Yeah. Right? essentially. <laughs> and because it didn't it start with 404. Yes. And uh, she's been up yeah. there for, you know, at least 50 seconds and her guns out of the fight. So. And that's one of the things as a coach, you know, you got to let your players know, you know, the checkoff points, right. Mm -hmm. Or it's really on the players to know what their oh. checkoff points are. Paula over gun battling a little bit when she didn't need to. But I obviously your player got in the snake. I don't think anyone on the rollers picked it up. No, you've but also got your your attack over here as well. And when you can get that double attack going, man. 
yeah, it, it just applies so much pressure. The, the hardest part is trying to dig out some of those bodies that are tucked away in towards the later stages of this point. JC has a good enough paintball IQ to know when Angie went down that she automatically switched and became the attacker. Mm-hmm. And now Corinne is doing the right thing by going down and crawling, not being lazy and trying to duck waddle her way in. And that was very, see how she went, there you go. She wrapped, did a slow, she did her checkoffs, realized, okay, I don't have anybody yet. Now she's going to do it again. So well done here. And this is the penalty, right? Uh, No. No, it's about to happen. It's about to happen. And it's coming from Michaela. You know, JC didn't really need to do that run through. She could have stopped at that wedge, reassess the situation, figure out where the body was. Right, because she's still at a minute 30 at that point. It's not it's not panic time yet at all. Correct. And you have the body advantage. And yes, technically at that point, it was a 2v3 situation, and we had the one body to potentially sacrifice to dig out to make it a 2v1. And See, there's the loader hit. Yep. And, uh, and here, she, see, she, she shoots, shoots her right, right there. there. And yeah, that's, so, that's the major. Yeah. And that took a minute to get assessed because the refs were arguing on if it needed to be a major, if it didn't need to be a major. And then the other player in the W that was so focused on the other side that her back was completely to Michaela. And this is yeah. what happens, right? Yeah. Player believes they shot the other player. They get super emotional. It's critical. It's in the finals. There's only 40 seconds left. Um, and you can hear it in the pits, right? You can hear her be like, I shot her. I shot her, you know, at that point, you know, as a coach, I really should have taken, taken over and tried to settle her down. But I was so busy with trying to figure out what the situation was going to be with the penalty. And I do. you've got Rich, here's some little advice, delegate someone who's not playing or someone for your pit and say, Hey, go stand over there until they come back with that. And let me know what said. In the meantime, you get her calm down and you have your play ready because you're probably going to have your play ready before this point ends i would hope yeah so yeah the other thing that i would also let michaela know is hey man i need you here right now in this moment that moment's gone yep so the other thing she's not wrong okay it's a minor for a hopper hit but it's a major if you shoot another player and and change the outcome of a point so the refs get it right here and they make the major and that was the right call well, and the high rollers know, right? They're out here with four bodies, yeah. right? They know. Yeah. So uh, there was no surprise. So um, they totally agree with Mike. Like I would just send somebody else over like, hey, make sure they're starting. And I tell them, make sure they're starting with four and just come tell me that that's what happening. It's happening. And I create two plays. One, if they get the call right, mm-hmm. one if they right. don't. One if they don't. Right. There it is. <laughs> yeah, and you can see me. I'm actually going over to the table, and I'm drawing out the play, you know, and assessing, depending on the information that we get, if it's a four-body, if it's a five-body, what we're going to do. Now, what I decided to do is I decided to throw a rope-a-dope on this one. Because they're down one player, I know that they're probably going to have a safety net. Only three players are going to be somewhat active, but it's going to be three guns up. The, the goal was to put Angie on the Dorito side to try to see how fast I could get her to push while they're all focused on snake side. Yeah, I like this play. I do too. Got your guns up. Everyone made their bunkers. And you've got pressure already applied. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I like I love that they start to go for it. It just what you know, it it, it it can't be one. They all have to go together, right? Correct. Right. Yeah. And it that just comes one. with time. Um, but I will say yeah, all goes last... again. One. Now had she, had she been ten steps behind the first clear, I think yeah. you got a different point there. Mm-hmm. Now it's overtime, right? Mm-hmm. And right. all last year. Um, we, we actually missed making Sundays because of overtime points. I think in one, I think it was Philly. We played four overtime matches. 
So oh, wow. in that moment, I look at the girls, I'm like, listen, it's just another point. You've been here before. We're just going to play our game. Don't worry about what they do. We know what their tendencies are. They're not going to try to take the snake. They're going to try to contain us. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Good shooting there on the wing. She had showed that tendency to go high into that. Yep. Because her next stop was that center. But you give him a body back on the on the low side. It we give him body back on the low side. Paula that got up into the center. If her gun was up just a little bit faster and holding the zone from the home, she would have caught that home side, D side player filling out to the Aztec. That is a lot of pods going up the middle. It really <laughs> she is. is. She is ready. She loves to lay paint, you know. Um, Paul is a great player. She just she wants to be more dynamic. She doesn't want to just always sit in the bunker and hold the zone because that's a very unforgiving, unforgiving job, right? The snake players always get all the glories, or the attackers always get the glories. Not the person that's sitting there dumping God knows how much paint into a particular zone. Yeah, Question for everyone. Game. In overtime situations, are you pulling out your highest percentage play for five alive, or are you taking risks that you've held in your back pocket all match? Highest That's percentage. a statistical analysis. That's going to be based off how the match has gone to that up to that point, what the other team's shown me, what I've seen success with, and from a statistical, you know. So there's a lot of different things that go into that. It's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Yeah. Typically, in my opinion – I would go with what's been working, right? Where can I get these players there alive and then they're comfortably, right? Because if they're comfortable, they'll execute. If they're uncomfortable, they probably won't be able to do the job. And, and that comes back to confidence, right? Right. Pulling a play out that you haven't used at all in the prelims or, or in anywhere on – that's not always the best thing to do. Even though you've practiced that play, but you haven't used it once the entire event, there is a comfort issue there, but something I tell my guys all the time is you better get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. So, And we run into the, in this overtime point, we run into the same issue that we ran into the previously um, previous point five, where we had the power play. We just weren't at our point, point three or four, where the bodies were just dug into the Dorito and that wedge that uh, W that player right there. Mm -hmm. Like she's just dedicated on the job. So that's kind of what I was um, circling earlier is really on that side. You have two players out wide who are dealing with one heads up and then the back center. Mm -hmm. And she does get out here. You know, if she just wraps into the back center and leaves her to be able to go low like this, she can't be shot by her. Right. Yeah. And she can go right underneath. Mm hmm. You can go right underneath and and then you know now they're dominoing that side of the field see now it's wide open right mm -hmm. they're dom able to domino that side of the field and that's just going to remove everything which it happens it just took a little while it just took a little while and and this is where i'm most critical with them is the sloppiness of closing this point out right we're already up four four bodies to two mm -hmm. right and in a four to and two that, body yeah, situation, we start throwing it away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you and every coach in paintball yells about that. That's right. <laughs> like everyone. <laughs> That's, yeah. You lose a high body situation or you have a four on two and you end up with a two at the end. That's, that's it's really frustrating. But it's situations like this with a good coach or somebody that asks a lot of questions, okay, how would you have broken this out or break this down even further with the bodies that you have to take to to break it open? Mm. See, well, to me, I would have shot that player right there, but I, I didn't get a chance to play the field, so I don't know what the angle looked like. I was wondering when this player was going to come through. She was in that back Aztec for a long time before she came to the snake because of this one player. You had the body advantage. We could have, with the center player up there like she was, she could have actually, with the line, 
there's a line that she could have taken where she could have pushed this. You could have fed the snake. The other player, the fact that she didn't know that that player was right there in front of her, that's a, that's a communication issue. Yeah. Well, and Paula, as soon as she recognized that the girl in front of her in the Dorito was shooting at JC, that it was her turn. That's it. That was her sign to go. Right. Yeah. So we should have lost, but at the same time, you're not going to in foresight wish it would have went the other way, right? As a coach, no, you'll, take, you'll take the win as a learning no. experience. No, totally. And, and understand that when Ryan says that, hey, you should have lost, it's a teachable moment. It's a learning moment, right? Because a lot of paintball's a lot of luck. It okay. is. It's not easy to win a tournament. And that's not. It's a game of centimeters, not a game of inches that everyone talks about. And that's what gets me with a lot of coaches or or, or players I see at the divisional level or even at the pro level. Oh, we're going to go win the tournament or we're going to go win this weekend. And it's like, have you ever made it out of prelims? Have you ever made it out of quarters? Have you taken the necessary steps, pieces to the puzzle mm -hmm. to get you there, to know what the formula is to win and put yourself in a position to win? And, and ultimately, one of the most difficult things for paintball teams to understand and to learn is what we would call the close, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that scramble with the chaos in the scramble, which is that mid game, right? Most teams got the, the beginning of the game, right? We've got the breakout. We know what the goal is. We know where we want to be, what we want to do when we get there. But now the scramble happens. A job change. Somebody dropped. This person did something we didn't expect them to do. Uh oh, this person's not where they're supposed to be. You know, yeah. and now there's the scramble and then there's the close. Mm -hmm. And if you're not closing as a team, that's seen. That's what the thing everyone talks about team paintball. The, the most important aspect of team paintball is in the close. You have to do that together. It can't be the individual players trying to be the wrecker, right? The wrecking ball. So yeah. um, once once you guys, I think I think once you guys get that, that's that third piece, because you seem to have the first first two pieces pretty well done. Well, thank you for that. And yeah, I think that's just going to come with time, right? Because we don't play as many NXL events as the men. Uh, we do our best with practices. We've changed personnel, right? So there's been a lot of change. Now is the time during this break, which is roughly, I think we got 90 days out before the next one to start working on tangible results, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And that's what I was talking to you and Mike when we were having our conversations is you know what would be some tangible things to look at so i had the girls go back watch the finals do homework what they did good what they did bad what we need to improve on um and what can be tangible to improve on before the next event yeah i would start doing situational drills with them where i'm doing a clock you have you know we're down by one and we've got two minutes to close it out mm -hmm. I do a whole bunch of that you know yeah, and those course, six minute and yeah, six minute yeah. and three minute up down drills are 100%. really important. I mean, like we, we sometimes you can go like a whole day of practice and then you do those kind of at the end and you realize like all the value is in that, you know, because 100%. you got real data and you got to really see your group under pressure mm -hmm. in real situations, right? Versus trying to manipulate those, uh, like Dylan Boyam saying like, Hey, do some three on three, some islands. Those are always really important. Right. Mm -hmm. But like you can do a whole day of those kinds of things, but then getting into situational things where there's a real clock and real scenario up down is key, right? It's key. And that's when you and video those mm -hmm. yes. so that you then have that, um, you have that video to, to send out to everybody and say, okay, here were our mistakes, right? Here's oh, where absolutely. we should have, yeah, when we shot this player out, this is where that tandem line needs to get really slim, right? Instead of having it really long and you playing in this large space, let's make it this big. That way, if we lose the person in front of us, we still own all that space, mm -hmm. right? And again, and, and, and you should always do them at the end of practice. I do believe that because I, I think you need to do that tired. You have to do it tired because it's it's when you're fatigued is when you make mistakes. Well, that yeah. and that's what makes champions. Right. And right. And, and again, this is just, this is the show and everything you guys put on is great because, you know, just like you guys preach to your players, you need to be doing this. Sometimes it goes in one ear and out the other, but when it's heard from other people, you know, it might sure. sink in, you know, but. 
Rich, thank you so much. We need to move on to Devin and the semi-pro match. Uh, really appreciate your time this evening and your insights, man. Uh, good luck the rest of the season to you and Dallas Vibe. I'm sure we'll have you back on because I have a feeling you're going to win some more. <laughs> I agree. Well, I appreciate it. You guys have a great night. Thank you for this opportunity. Rich, be yeah, safe, man. brother. We'll talk to you soon. Be safe, guys. Yeah, see you, brother. Good stuff. Cool, man. Yeah, he's an interesting guy. I really yeah, like. I, him. I like the fact that he's taking accountability when he says he goes, "That's yeah. on me. I should have. I should have done this, or I should have said this, or I." I think that's totally. That's good. That's showing a good growth. Yeah, at some point we'll uh, we'll talk about AC Diesel, and I'll uh, beat myself up for an hour and <laughs> talk about all let's, the mistakes I made. Do it. We can talk yeah. about the mistakes, but then we can also talk about what you did do right. Sure, we'll talk we about that at some them. point, man. Well, let's get Devin in here and let's talk about the Sea Dogs. Devin Strickler. Hey, guys. How's it going? How are things up in the Great White North? Uh, they're rainy today. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming in and uh, really appreciate being here. And I apologize. I, I think I mentioned on... Um, SK and Mike's episode when we were breaking down the program that I, I didn't think either one of those two you guys had a coach and I, I had run over to this premier field to commentate a game because there was no one to do it and so I ran over there to commentate a game and I asked Dan Shelley I was like hey man will you get some photos of the coaches and he sent me the photos of the coaches and I didn't see any of you guys. So I'm so sorry. <laughs> no um, I apologize. Somebody jumped in and, and uh, said, Hey, I think they do have a coach. And, um, and then you messaged us. So I, I appreciate you doing that. And again, I apologize, man. And um, excited to get to know you a little bit, talk about a little bit about the sea dogs. I coaching notorious have a decent amount of experience playing against the sea dogs. Cause we played you guys several times and always, um, when I sh saw you guys on the schedule, that was one of the matches I was most excited about right. because you guys play this really high tempo, really ballistic kind of style, uh, but then do a good job of mixing it up, right? You guys would do two, three points that are really ballistic and then you pull the reins back really fast and it's this really uh, very conservative, very pocketed breakout and um, always had one and two point matches with you guys. So it was... Uh, I always felt like we knew more going into Sunday if we got to play you guys. Yeah, like, sure. it, it, you know what I mean? Like, there were a couple of teams uh, throughout our semi pro season that I was like, man, if we get an opportunity to play this team, we're going to know more, right? Because you're going to throw a lot of stuff at us and, and make us uncomfortable. And so uh, it's really exciting to see what you guys are going to do this year. You are one of, uh, one of the teams that has been mentioned on this show many times about opportunity in semi-pro uh, leverage, of course, is one of those teams too, with, uh, you know, Chris Caputo coming back and, and there's lots of guys on that roster who've been around a long time. So um, kind of like we were talking about with rich, but adversely, it seemed like you guys had an opportunity uh, to win this match. Um, there are a couple of them, you know, one, um, a few too many penalties uh, yeah. <laughs> occurred, right? Um, and then we'll kind of talk about some clock management things, which we talked about in the green room before before we started the show. Um, but, like, really this was another one of those matches, like, it, it, it could have gone either way with a couple of less mistakes, you right. know? Yeah. Because like they made plenty. Can, I'm sorry, Ryan, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say uh, leverage made plenty of mistakes. You know, yeah, there, were, there right. were there were opportunities in this match for you guys to kind of take it. it just didn't happen. Yeah. And what I wanted to ask, Devin, heading into this match, right? Yeah. What kind of scouting had you done on leverage? Because um, I'm, I'm curious about some of your play calls. Well, we knew that Caputo, Caputo went to the snake almost every single point. So our, mm -hmm. every time we were tr trying to shoot him. Um mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the shots were quite a bit different going to the pro field from what they were on the semi pro field. The mound in the center mm -hmm. of the field changed them up quite a bit. So yes, what we had totally. what we had game planned for unfortunately didn't work out. Um, it was a little late. The adjustments, like I, I wanted to try at least try what we were doing before. I, I'm not going to just 
go in and make right. You're not going to abandon without, without, without knowing, right? We've played, <laughs> right. we've played, we've won up until this point doing what we're doing. We're going to keep doing it. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Until until it doesn't work, right? And then we're going to make some adjustments after that. Right. Um, the, get and then after, here. besides Caputo running, they were pretty pocketed on the break. And then they like uh, we recognize that they like to be up in the center, especially when they when they realized that we weren't wide or a team wasn't wide on one side they were trying to get up so we called it the china but the uh the brick in the center mm -hmm. they're trying to get up there and um and lock that one side down um and we 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 baited them twice with it um uh with a bounce shot which we'll see we'll see when we get into the match mm -hmm. yeah um, sure. and then they were a little bit slower on the on the the Dorito side. Right. Um, it did seem like they pressed the action though, and that the Sea Dogs were content to kind of get your guns up and, like you said, try and get on Caputo uh, yeah. at the expense of, of an initial attack of your own. Which we did. I mean, I, th I feel like we did do a pretty good job of, he did get into the snake and it was what it was. We, I mm -hmm. felt like we still did a pretty good job of keeping him at bay. Um, mm -hmm. It was just the, the rest of it. Like when you're when you're putting attention on one player like that, it, the rest of the team has to step up, and they did. Did you guys feel like maybe yeah, now that you've had a couple of weeks to sort of reflect, do, do you guys feel like maybe you were a little too defensive? A little, yeah. It's one of the one of the things I wish we could have changed. Um, looking back yeah. at it, like they they didn't really put much emphasis on trying to stop our snake side um especially with shots on the break yeah um it looked like you guys had some opportunities yeah and we were i don't i don't want to call it nerves because the guys are pretty relentless out there mm -hmm. in terms of the attack the attack that we normally have and that we did have up and up until this match um but like we were pretty much all weekend we were pretty much free to go into the snake whenever we want and that's part of the reason why i stayed a little bit shallow was we when we'd we'd stay shallow um and then we didn't we could pretty much get into the snake whenever we wanted from those in, inside bunkers mm -hmm. okay well let's jump into the match yeah. so at this so, point you're thinking hey it, it ain't broke we don't know if it's broke so we're gonna well, go on that on this first play we actually do try going into the snake on the break and they end up shooting us Ooh. Yeah, Ooh. I'm sure he did Ooh. since he came yeah. off the box about half a second early there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he did. Yeah, so we end up we lose our back center guy right away early on in, in the point as well, which is did, did he explain to you what picked him up? Uh yeah, he said he got bumped. They were they were putting pressure back and he because we doubled it up, he said they um he got bumped out a little bit, but <clears throat> Yeah, leverage then, has already established heavy pressure. At this yeah, point. I was trying to figure out what the player in there, the bottom side, um, Dorito Snake is is doing. I think there was a little, there was a small little gap. They fix it. They fix it after this point, but you could like, so our back center guy was just pumping it underneath, like the, okay, the, the gap see. between the beam and the the wedge. I see. And then and that's I was going to say. Yeah, so there was, and I remember seeing this right before this match started as I was running over to the semi-pro field. There was a small, uh, and again, I know I'm so sorry, it's hard to see this mouse. Uh, somebody's already told me. There was a gap right there and another little one right there that the back center guy could just pound paint through. Yeah, and I, I blow the horn pretty soon here. I'm always going to give my guys a chance to try to do something. So when I see them get, going into, and it's five on two at this point, like when we're seeing defensive postures like this, I'm just going to blow the horn. That's right. Yeah, because it's obvious they're not going to take the decision out of your hands and try and make something happen. So yeah, yeah. Apologies here. I don't know what's happening. So leverage uh, aggressive and winning some gunfights on the first point. So. At this point, so I'm looking at his face there, right? Yeah. yeah so what's cool. going what's going through your Hand team's head? What are you saying to your guys at this point? And what's your thought process 
Okay, that wasn't the, the way we wanted to start. So how do we get them back and how do we get them refocused on the next point? Yeah. Um, nice big t-shirt, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I know I, I have a few, I don't think that because they went to, we called it the Cobra, but the like the Dorito side snake and they went there on the break. I knew that they weren't going to go there again. Um, I figured that they were going to take a shot at the snake here. Um, so I end up putting two guns on it. Plus I go out to the Dorito one here. Um, it was looking at it. It was a little bit different of a shot, but when you got out to the Dorito one, if your first engagement was high, um, you could shoot right down into the snake one. And we caught a lot of guys doing that. Mm -hmm. um, just being unaware that a lot of teams didn't take too many shots going out wide on that side. Um, so we figured we could catch him crawling around here. Unfortunately, we missed our shot. Um, and it was tougher on this field because we saw that at practice too. It was more difficult on this field because of the hill. Yeah. yeah. Like it was – you, you said ahead, something Mike. interesting there, Devin. You said you said I knew they weren't going to go back there. What made you What made you so sure? Uh, even if they did, if we put one gun on it, and I was it was I put our best laner on that zone. Um, if they mm -hmm. did, if they did go back there, we were going to shoot them. I was confident in that. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And I just the route that he took was pretty unorthodox. Um, mm -hmm. And he was honestly he was the only one that was Caputo was the only one that was running um on their team alfred is it was the who was their one on that side mm -hmm. um, he wasn't taking i don't i didn't he might have i don't i'm not 100 percent sure i didn't scout all of their matches um from mm -hmm. what i've seen he pretty he played he pretty much played from that tower every point right no yes. pressure devin but yeah. ronnie Dizon is in the chat okay <laughs> hey ronnie all right so going to this point you guys are on the right and you take that first Dorito and of course Buddha's in that snake again. Yeah. <laughs> he's tough to shoot, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's, he's fast. fast. He's quick. He's fast. <laughs> yeah. He's hard to shoot and he's tiny. You know, it's not like, it's like a pencil running across. Yeah. Um, so I believe they get, I believe they try to come up the center here. They recognize they, I told the guys before this that we were staying shallow on the snake side. Um, we just played the the mini W and the temple. Um, I told them that like if they recognize that we're shallow on that side, they're going to try to come up the center. Um, mm -hmm. And when we so the bounce shot that we were shooting was off that the pins covered in paint the, the one pin. we decided. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But so we ended up clipping. We end up clipping him, and he gets a minor from that which opens it up unfortunately we're about to get one here <laughs> that's what i was going to say this is one of those points like as a coach that i want to punch someone yeah you know? like, we were, like five, hey, we're up five on three here and we just give it right back to them yeah they give us a gift right and yeah not just a gift but now really you're only dealing and they're kind of they're stuck right granted yeah. you can turn the field now like a clock but i did want to ask a question here two questions actually one you said we were going to go we we're going to go shallow here in and play it this way so when you said that do the mm. guys already have an understanding of what that means does that mean they they stay put they become potted plants what are no, they no 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 they know they know that oh. felt, we talked about it all weekend and that was our game plan it was just to like i've tried to adapt like i call it it's a more of like a dynasty approach for our guys and it's getting this getting the spots that we can win gunfights from i feel like we're our guys now are some of the best if not the best gunfighters in semi-pro um i believe that as a coach watching these guys every weekend okay. um valid so i'm i'm we're we're, we're getting a kill or two and then we're we're filling out from there right as we as guys drop jobs there's jobs that aren't needed that are go going to open up for, allow guys to start making moves Right. Um, the was one the goal, uh, real quick question um, was the goal when that gentleman ran to the, the first Dorito there on the break. And I noticed he just posts up on the outside of that wedge. Yeah. Was that, was that his role? His gun? Hey, look, if, if Caputo gets in there and he wraps, that's my job. Yeah. Um, he, we noticed that Caputo engaged his first engagement from the snake was typically high. And mm -hmm. I felt personally, I felt that being in the Dorito one gave you a better shot on that. So his job was 
to have the first engagement high on that. If you miss your shot on him, then fill in to try to make your move into the second Dorito. I just engaged yeah. to tape. Yeah, so here, and this is the same feedback, by the way, that I'm giving my own group. Um, anytime this guy can come in and go low, you don't have any idea, right? When you're when you're in that Dorito one, you need to either be out in this corner, like as soon as you know the guy's in the snake, the idea should be to get the guy out in, into this corner or up into the next Dorito where can he, he can keep the guy from wrapping, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the other question I have in this setup that that we're I've froze on. Why isn't this guy, why isn't your guy going into the snake now? Like what was happening where you're, you're, you're dominant on that side of the field, you're two on none. Um, all the guns on the field are now toward the low side. Neither one of these guys, um, it just seemed like there was a, an awareness issue here. These guys needed to be attacking, right? Yeah, like, a little bit. Clock, so, right? yeah. So, like right now i would say because they have it's a three on three i i just th i think they just don't want to make a huge mistake um you know he does but like sometimes does, the the no, mistake I, is doing nothing oh, I, I, like yeah we, 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 talked, it. <laughs> we, we talked about it after we, we got back we got back to the house after this match and we broke it down um right there while it was all fresh in our minds still um this is the thing like it it just took too long right like we're we're out right. there. We're right. We're not doing the things that we should be doing. Right. Like right, right. now, they're up, they're essentially on, they're in that snake three. They're on our side of the field. Um, they own the field. They have the field advantage. All we have to do to get that field advantage back though is just to match them in that snake, and then we're in a better position mm -hmm. because we're in, we own, because we have that Dorito, and they're yeah, just they turn have the nothing clock. on that side. Right. Mm -hmm. Just turn the clock. And yeah. it's something that it's something that we try. I tried to emphasize emphasize well i wasn't i wasn't able to make practice this event we practiced down in cali um because of the weather here but there's one thing that i tried to emphasize with the guys at practice was with working on was to expect that field to flip that this we recognized that the snake side was probably going to be the dominant side most of the time and that we want to try to flip this field or expect the field to flip at least right um and we we do do it we're just a little slow at do, getting there yeah stuart rigel is in the chat welcome stuart mr who's that new orleans hurricane himself who's stuart rigel who's stuart rigel? <laughs> sounds like a cold Stu, you got you there gotta come back with something snarky man so there you here go. it is. You finally fed the snake, and your corner player here. I think he's he's piecing it together and understanding that hey, we're flipping it here. Yeah, yeah, and he's telling him he's in the snake. Like again, we recognize like to shoot him, we need to. You have to. It's snake. Th this is the shot snake to the snake three. When we met, like sit up, he doesn't. I don't think that they re recognize that we were in the snake at this point. Um, Do you know why he stopped at the? the second snake right yeah there. to try to get it try to get a shot on caputo it for I, I believe it forced him to back up there um and he's he's seen it because i'm pretty sure he goes to the next spot here and then once he once he sees him back up then he then he just goes to the next spot <clears throat> And like this, I talked to I Dylan's the Dylan's the our player in the Dorito here, and I talked to him after this point as well. It's like when we, we sitting in that Dorito one in this situation is not really doing too much. Like it, if he if he does sit in that snake three like Caputo, then um, that he still he has pretty much free reign to do what he wants. If you miss that back shot up there him. and gets get shot by, and that's the one that's another thing that we've tried really hard at at practice. Um, I've been on the guys about making shots, right? When you, you're only get you're like, we're playing good enough paintball now. Like you're only going to get one shot at a guy. If you, if you miss that engagement, you're never going to get it again. Or right. like, like you need He's to hit shot makes right the perfect there. line. He's got the perfect line on this, by the way, he makes the great read here on the outside of that wedge, puts the tower between him and the, the wedge, pushes this guy in. And this is, this is a beautiful, beautiful read here. Yeah. Yeah, Garrett's really good at closing out points. Ooh. Ooh. 
We we were coming down the tape there. We shot him in the arm. He didn't even shoot him though. He the reason he was out because he came out of bounds. Right. He slid out of bounds. Yeah. yeah. He's like, I'm not hit. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bounds, bro. My <laughs> ooh was he's still shooting from out of bounds. Oh. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My ooh wasn't maybe he got shot. My ooh was he's still shooting and he's out. So we've tied it up and we've got eight minutes on the clock, a little bit over eight minutes. Um it, on this next point, Leverage is once again going to be first to the attack. But you win a couple of gunfights, um, and you have a pretty good close here. This, this I think, was probably one of your your better points when it comes to the closing. Um, but we'll take a look at it here, and we'll, we'll see if Coach remembers well. <laughs> yeah, they were killing you with that, that clock, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, it kept, I think, honestly, it felt like every point it just, it would freeze. And when it was freezing, I don't know if they were having the issue, but when it freeze like that, this, my screen would just shut right off. No, they were stopping it because the semi pro field and the pro field were so close together that yeah. teams were going on the semi pro field's horn. Oh. <laughs> so it happened on day one on the pro field six times in the first two matches. Oh. They were pretty close. They were pretty. They were pretty close. <laughs> All right, clocks at five seconds here. Leverage definitely going heavy that route, using that route on the opposite side to get that gun up on that yeah. snake entry point. Yeah, I like that route. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, we end up filling out to this tower. I believe Derek here went to gun. You were already in the out. Dorito corner, though. That's yeah. Very, uh, so the yeah, so we went there on the break, um, just to help, just to try to control the snake. Um, and I loved that. I thought that was a great adjustment, just to put the guy in the space already, so that Caputo, if he comes to your end, only has the inside. Yeah, and then we, I, I yeah, and then I left our guy at the mini wall to. Uh, to keep him to, to basically pin him in there, right? It may render him useless. So we win a gunfight there, right? Shoot their wedge, and then we get another. We're gonna get another kill on this uh, center guy from this bounce shot. Mm -hmm. um, I believe I think they picked it up after this. After we shoot him here, he realizes he's like, okay, here's a, here's where it's coming from. <laughs> yeah, you're shooting it from that low tower into that pin. Yeah, yeah, and I think you it's can right see here. it they, bouncing they, they, right there. They, Shoot yeah. it lower, and you'll get him. Yeah, there. yeah, it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go. So, Ronnie Dizon said they did that once, but he didn't move a muscle once he. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did that once, but I didn't move a muscle. Yeah. Uh, Seawright tore a muscle when he went out there, and, and, uh, <laughs> so he didn't move much either. So good feed underneath there. See, but, but I didn't like this. I didn't so either it, because what should have happened yeah. is the power guy should have done that, and he should have stayed in the corner. Yes, because now he gives away the opportunity for Chris to be low and wrap, right? Like if he stays out in the corner, he eliminates a lot of this opportunity. Oh yeah, for sure. Now, well, now Chris yeah, still thinks he's like in the this. corner. Yeah but now we're starting to there we go now we're starting to piece it together and get down the field counter on the opposite side yeah and the guys get a little we talked about this after two the guys get a little uh like we we know we have the advantage we know we're five on three and we get it we just we we've had issues in the past i wouldn't call it issues because it's good sometimes but like it's blood in the water like when we recognize that we're up we get happy gun gunfight happy to try to close it out hmm. um like here i would have i would have liked for us to like try to dig caputo out but then like leave these last two try to leave them a little bit longer get into better positions kill, take some more time off the clock and Well, we'll talk about that in a second because you had an opportunity to add <laughs> yeah, a little time right. to the clock. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so. <clears throat> All right. 
Good point. Yeah. So, like That's I said, good, good close. Um, winning some good fights and a good close with a counter push on the opposite side. Well done. Um, what are we sitting at? I think we still got five minutes left on the clock. Yeah, I think it's just over five minutes. Yeah. So the play that we're – my mindset coming back, and the guys are feeling good. Um, I've liked – I've liked what we've been doing um, to stop them at this point, to hold them up. We're up at this point, so I'm trying to kill a little bit more time. So I'm, I, I believe I go back to the Drita one here. The other yep. four, are the, uh, the other four are the same here. So. Leverage isn't going to change anything. They're going to go back to the snake. There's, there's no doubt they're going to go back to the snake with Caputo. Um, but let me ask you this, because if I recall. We get another penalty here. Yes, we get another penalty. And, and was and, and I and I'm going to ask this because I don't know very many guys on the Sea Dogs. I am familiar with the Sea Dogs, but I don't. Was was this a was this a player pushing the envelope and not trusting um, these other players or not really? Like traditional, honestly, traditionally we're touch wood. We're we're very disciplined and we don't get too many. We're maybe one or two penalties an event. Mm -hmm. um, this event, I don't know if it. I don't, I don't necessarily know what to chalk it up to if it's just off-season rust or what. We had 11 penalties all tournament long, which is oh my gosh. very, like, very, yeah, very, very uncharacteristic of us. Um, I will tell you to have 11 penalties and make it to this match is a miracle. We've talked about that in length with, with the guys. If you guys don't get penalties, you're probably the best team in semi-pro. That's uh, right. I, I've that's, got to know what you. That's what. That's 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 the point I'm trying to hammer across with them. Is like sure. On like yeah. five on five on five. I, I mean, I have to believe it. I do believe it. Is we're we're the best team in semi pro five on five, and we're only going to hurt ourselves. Yeah. We only hurt ourselves when we get penalties like that. Well, it certainly, in my opinion, cost you this match. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> wow, that's incredible. Because you mer you mercyed several teams. You mercy two teams. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, that's incredible that you. I'm pretty sure on we had a, we had a real tough go on Friday. I believe there was only we were one and one on Friday, and we of the points that we lost, I think there was only one that we lost that we did not get a penalty on. Yeah. All right. So yeah. a player just lost it. He he lost a gunfight. He got he got clipped in the hopper. Has the penalty occurred yet? Yeah, the, the penalty already happened. It happened. It was our Jack best Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was the Dorito Tower guy, the Dorito Temple guy that got clipped. So now I believe it's a five on two. Then. I think it's I think it's four on two. We killed one on the break. Okay. On yeah. This point. One, yeah, you two. killed one on the top side on the break. And then I think there's another. I think it's a three on two. <clears throat> Interesting that tandem line be between Caputo and his players long now too yeah yep and i feel like we make a pretty uh a mistake here and clayton is the player in the wing over on the snake side and he makes a fill back into the temple i feel like he makes a mistake when he does this I, so I, he just he just opens himself up for to, for caputo to be able to even engage with him like when, he, when he's at that wing caputo, there's nothing caputo can do to yeah, because he can to play deal, all the way to, to deal the back with him, of it, right? I, yeah. I think yeah, I, I think the idea was to surprise him, and but they, that's not going to work in that situation. I don't no. think nine times out of ten, it might one time. And that's what I mean. Like you surprise him, but as soon as you miss that shot, then you're just you're just at such a disadvantage. Yeah. And now you're, now you're stuck, and you're a bigger target, and he's mm -hmm. got a better angle. Boom. Now this was interesting. And they they check each other and they're still two forty five, but yeah. And I seen the player on. I wasn't the reason I didn't hit the towel here was because of his elbow. I seen oh, I no. seen the I seen the pain on his elbow coming down. I thought you know what I'm just gonna let him hit it. Mm -hmm. he, that was the player that was in. He was in the snake corner um, for the longest time. 
and to me like it, it was like right in front of me to me it looked like a hit i don't i'm not sure why the ref didn't call it well at distance but, it's round right it looks like a yeah yeah but a lot of pain on that center bunker it really was <laughs> yeah a lot of pain on that center bunker that's always one of those risk reward things of as a coach where it's really difficult to make that decision about whether or not you're going to do it or not do it. And you just got to own it either way. Yeah. Right? Right. Like if I, if I towel here and I give us another 15 seconds, it was, it, and then we win the match because we needed that extra 15 seconds. I'm a hero, right? I don't towel it. And then we lose the match and needed the 15 seconds now I've made the wrong decision, yeah. right? Darn so if gotta, you do, darn if you don't. <laughs> yeah. You got to own it either way. You got to own it, right? All right, so what was the thought process heading into this point? Yeah. Did you, um, you I didn't think – I didn't think – I didn't – win this match? What are, what are you saying? Yeah, so I double up my guns on the snake side here. I take a – I believe I go to the, the snake Dorito here. Um so I double up my back center guys. I have one gun on it from the left and then the gun on the right wraps around to put paint on him. And then he's, his job was to fill into this. He, he was more of a read option. If we get that kill, then he's filling forward. Um, and if we miss that kill, then he's going to fill out. Um, and then our we ended up losing Dylan here on the break, going to that wedge. So that's the only time we got shot there all tournament long going there his job was actually to, going to be to come up the center here and um sit and try to surprise caputo as well i don't think that they would have expected that or he would have expected that um it's not something that we had shown too too much of um, unfortunately he takes one on the break there so the contingency though so if that 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 plays blown right he gets shot and his job was to go to the center i see you the uh, is his two filters into the wedge behind him is he going to stick to the game plan or is there a new goal do you have a contingency for that <clears throat> yeah he's gonna if if we, if we get the kill on him is that what you're saying no i'm just saying you lost the guy who has had a sp sp very specific job and now he's not there to do it yeah so that, that was the read option so like our player from the back center that was supposed to come he was that so he fills over he from the back center he fills over into that um mini wedge on the snake side okay okay to put pressure back on that snake side anyway but there's only three left right These yeah three there's three here. left here um i figured that there was still enough time um to try to make something happen here um we have right now like the positions that they're in we have an opportunity the positions that we're in and that they're in we have an opportunity to fill into the snake here um unfortunately we don't recognize that and i right it, it would have been i feel like it would have been a completely different point had we taken advantage of that instead of staying so close together and honestly essentially waiting to die right yeah because his gun you you can see he's inside right mm -hmm. he's not heads up and low wrapping looking for the for this gun right he mm -hmm. he's he's looks to be content shooting inside this is where like i me as a coach I see this posture. I'm I'm probably hitting the horn right now. Yeah. Right now. Because yeah. I know chances of me losing this point are really high. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if we're not look if this guy is not wrapped and looking for opportunities to be in these spaces, I'm blowing I'm throwing the towel. Or if you're or if your Aztec's not looking to get to that corner to draw the gun so that your guy can feed the snake and do a wrap and trap. I mean, those are the types of things, right, that that you need to be looking for. And um, and I'm not saying that you weren't. What I am saying is that, you know, there, there are multiple options here. But to your point, I think uh, at two minutes now, they've got the body advantage. They're now here in the snake. We know they're in the snake. And it's it's almost like, like you said, they're waiting to die because that posture is defensive. Yeah. So now with him there, you know. Yeah, now you're not gonna, you can you're not gonna that there. gap and the force multiplier comes up behind him he can come off the job now and, and add a second gun to the attack so you're really not getting into that snake now no yeah and see again he was you know the guy who can turn the field is playing inside right now he's going back to the heads up um and in my notes here this is the one i said this was your point 
right? Like for you as a coach, this was your opportunity to uh, have an impact on the game. And yeah, no, I I, I feel that. I, we talked about it a little bit and before the show, and yeah, and I'm sure it's like, definitely it's a a learning moment for sure. Yeah, like all of us, you know, you beat the snot out of yourself uh, yeah. for a week, and then you dust off and get back at it. Hey, Devin, but you're, you're absolutely right. You're darned if you do, darned if you don't, uh, to what he was saying earlier. For instance, a lot of people um, have asked me why I didn't concede in the uh, in prelims against Infamous, right, when it was at about like a minute 30 or so. And they're like, you're in bad position. It's a minute 30. It's tied. They're, they're going to win the point. Yeah. And I had to ask myself, well, statistically speaking, when I had those three positions and those three players on the field, it – it took on average, you know, on a minute 40 <laughs> to close it out. So I said I can, you know, but then let's say at how long would it take me to, to win a point, right? So I had to make that decision. I had to roll the dice. We were in Vegas after all. So so I feel you on this, right? So from what I understand, you were trying to concede the button. You were trying to hit the button around 30, even though we didn't get to it what, 20? Yeah, so our clock had, before the point, our clock had stopped working. The pit clock so i was up at the near the scoreboard so i could see the time um again this is a, another learning moment for me to just delegate somebody to the button um <clears throat> but i came back down to hit it and as as i was coming back down the guys were coming off the field and they were um emotional upset, upset. um in my haste to get to my guys to talk to them um i thought i hit the button i I guess I didn't. Um, and again, like that's a big mistake on my part. Right? Like I need to hear that horn go off, make sure I do, or delegate me. Hey, I need you to hit this. Right? I need you to be my towel guy here. Because think, because think of it this way: if I recall, this final point you run with nine seconds, had you had two more, three more seconds, <laughs> yeah, I think you, you hit it. that buzzer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, and and. Devin, I want to be really clear too. Like we're obviously being incredibly critical, but you think about the number you're talking about, the number of penalties, the number of mistakes and things that you can change as a coach mm -hmm. and you're sitting in second place, right? Yeah. So you have all of these awesome, you know, all this great data to work throughout the rest of the year to get corrected and fixed and and to be able to make all those mistakes and still be in the final match <laughs> of your band. Band. Yeah, and it's, it's awesome. like again like we can you know beat this thing up over and over and over again but the reality is you made it to the final match with all of these things going on um and now you just have a, a, a new learning experience right at every event go walk the pro field make sure the shots that like on day one right go yeah. Yeah, though with that's intent. what that's what I that's what I that's what I'll will be doing going forward is with intention yeah. of being on that field walking in as well because like we came over there we I assumed that we would have more time but they give you three minutes before your match pretty much and that's yeah it's it. not much time <laughs> no. it's yeah. not much time yeah no right. it's not much time the other good thing too is like when you get to the pro field all of the staff that's over there is so helpful like. They are. Jason and um, Roderick, like the crew that's all hanging around, they're all so helpful. And if you ask questions like, hey, if my buzzer is not working, what do I do? Right. Like they'll tell you, hey, just yell towel. We'll, we'll take care of it. Right. Um, like they want the matches to be really, really good. Um, and because we have technology problems as a, a sport, we know we have technology problems, which is so funny to me that we're this far into <laughs> X-Ball and we still can't figure out how to make the damn buttons work. Uh, like, but we're going to have those things. But the staff that's there, they're awesome, man. Like they want to be helpful. So uh, it's not like being on some of the divisional fields where it seems like the staff and the refs are really angsty. It's not that way when you get over to the pro field. Like they're everybody's in a, in, it, for the most part, in really good spirits. They want it. They, they're excited too because it's Sunday, right? And so they're all the divisions coming on. They don't have just the pro players out there constantly trying to cheat. Uh, and you know what I mean? Like literally, yeah. you have ten guys on the field trying to get away with everything they can every single point, right? Uh, not that I don't think you guys are probably doing that too, but um, but when you get over there, eleven like, penalties. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, you're not getting away with a lot, right? You're not getting yeah. away with much. So might be trying. Might, trying to <laughs> might be trying a little. <laughs> yeah, but no, and I want to piggyback on what Ryan's saying, though, Devin. It's easy for us to be critical, right? It's, yeah. it's completely easy. But the fact that you you and your team overcame the amount of adversity you've already described to us, and you got second place, and it looks like you almost tie it up here in this, this last point. Good play call, by the way. Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing. Like, I love this play call. I, I love it. Like, your staggered attack is perfect. Yeah. It really is. It's one of the – I've tried to pride myself on defensive and offensive structure um, and figuring out – there's a lot – I feel like a lot of – a lot of coaches need to work on um, – they get out there and they come up with game plans, but they don't necessarily know what to do in, in end-of-game situations. Um so I make sure we always have plays to that we know what we're gonna do. See, even right there, fifty-four, number fifty-four on your squad looks over at the rep and he's like, "I don't have to have a pack, right?" And the ref's like, "No, <laughs> like they're helpful." You know, you ask that on yeah. some of the other fields, they're gonna be like, "I don't know where or don't." <laughs> yeah. You know. No, and that the <laughs> fact that you just said that, you know, structure, whether it's defensive or offensive, have a structure. Look at the staggered attack. This is well done right here. And I love this because, boom, you got two backs. And here he comes. He's right there. Yeah. He was right there. So, again, you blow the horn earlier in that one point. Yeah. And this whole thing is that is number different. 59 that, that is at is the different. buzzer, but he had run out of time. Yeah. 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 I don't think he I don't think he's hit. I think he I don't think he had a hit on it. So no, he no. didn't. <clears throat> so wow. Oh it's that it's closed. like that it photo. hurts. It, it hurts real bad. It's like that photo that they captured in the finals when I'm talking to Ryan after the match is over and I've got my hand on his shoulder and I'm doing this. Yeah. So close. <laughs> we were Devin, right. you could be you could be sitting here as me and be the coach of the last place team in your division. Yeah. Yeah, there's right perspe perspectives. Like, every perspectives. Every perspective is key, right? You got to be right. grateful in the moments that matter. So that's absolutely right. At, I mean, yeah, at, man. At the end of the day, we we didn't do what we accomplished. To we're we feel like we can we can be in contention every event. We were uh, we set ourselves up pretty well for the season here. Um, totally, and we look yeah. we look forward to the long grind of the season and being being in contention right till the end. Well, best of luck to you, Devin. And by the way, uh, great advice to other coaches out there listening. When he sat there and talked about structure, that's right. Have the structure and have plays already developed for, for scenario plays. So that situational plays, so that there's no question about what you're going to do. And everyone knows what part they're supposed to pay, play in the play. Mm -hmm. For sure. Good it's, stuff. Yeah, real important. <clears throat> I do think – I think overall you coached a good match. I do think you guys could have been more aggressive. It looked like there were a few opportunities that um, cost you guys a decent amount of time, like in the close, which you you said you've already kind of brought up to your group, which I, those things too are really tough when you get that deep into Sunday. You've probably been playing five to six guys yeah. the whole time, I, right? I, we talked about it. I, fatigue definitely played a – played a factor in our match too. But like that's not that's no excuse though, because they're those guys the guys we're playing against are just as tired. They've yeah. they've gone through the well, same well, gauntlet, right? So what are you gonna do right. about it? Yeah. So as a coach, what do you what are you gonna do about that? Are you requiring your guys to do a fitness regime between now and the next event or through that the rest of the season? What kind of adaptation we, have you done? The guy the guys are generally pretty good. Uh, most of the guys are pretty good at um just being in the gym regularly anyway. Um well we're gonna up the intensity of practice a little bit. Um there Especially like we, we're we're at practice. We've we've got a practice scheduled this weekend. We're off uh, the following weekend, and then we've got um, double days um, the two weekends prior. Um, this weekend, and then the so technically two two weekends before the event, um, we'll be um, we're going to be pretty dog tired by the end. <laughs> uh, Matt of Bear Ridge uh, out of Georgia, the coach uh, coming in second is rough, but y'all look good. And he knows because they came in second in D2. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. So during this time of year, like where do you guys practice? Uh, it's tough for us. We don't, the indoor fields in, in Ontario have 
closed down. COVID was pretty rough on yeah. the fields around here. Um, mm -hmm. So the closest the closest indoor field for us is uh, um, GRC in New York, and it's like for most of the guys, it's like a four hour drive. Um, so some of not all not all the guys were able to make it out too too much in the off season. Some of them were out there quite a bit though. Um, yeah, but like right now, where do you guys practice? So right now the weather the weather's turning here now. Like this weekend, we'll be out we'll be outside the rest of the year um, at Adrenaline Paintball in London. Um, they have a yeah. they have a real top notch facility. Um, that's where we practice out of most of the time. They've got excellent turf, some of the best I've ever seen. Um, so we'll be out there now, and it's it'll, it'll be dry and it'll be fine now. We've got to battle the weather a little bit, but most of the yeah man most of cool the country does <laughs> yeah okay. yeah well we hope uh to see you back right we'll uh hopefully the next time we have you back with well, the conversation will be slightly different but yeah. uh <laughs> nonetheless congratulations yeah congratulations to you and your group um it's a really exciting year in semi-pro right because it's yeah. uh we pull the giants kind of out new giants get to emerge right mm -hmm. Um, and it's really, I've been a fan since the first time I, we played you guys, uh, just again, because of the tempo and the intensity of the match and, uh, watching you guys play all of the monsters, if you will, uh, you guys are always really competitive. You're always in every match. Uh, it's a ton of fun to watch the development that's happening. Um, some little corrections. And I think you guys are, you're well on your way. I think probably 11 penalties in one event is maybe a little too many. Um, you know, maybe two is appropriate, yeah. <laughs> right? But 11 might be a, a little bit of a problem, but it's not uh, Mike. It's not Mike. The, yeah. <laughs> if I wasn't laying on it the sarcasm enough, I can try again. <laughs> yeah. If I wasn't laying it on thick enough, the sarcasm, I can try again if you'd like. Um, but I'm really excited for you guys. And it's, and again, like the, the few people sounding off, you know, talking about Canadian paintball. And I think that's, it's awesome too, to see anytime we get teams from, you know, different parts of, of, of the world, you know, I know it's still North America, but, uh, anytime we get teams from, from other places coming in and, and making waves, it's, it's really good for paintball and it's really good for hopefully really good for paintball in Canada. Right. Oh yeah. It, it, um, it is for sure. The, yeah, it, it feels pretty good. Like we've we've definitely got a lot of fans supporting us, and we're very appreciative of that. Although the, as the tournament goes on, we get lots of fan support and messages and of encouragement. It's very much appreciated. It it helps the guys out a lot to know that there's a lot of people pulling for us. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Draw on that, All right, brother. <laughs> yeah, thanks again for uh, joining us, and we appreciate your time this evening. And uh, what time is it where you are? uh it's 10 o'clock oh my gosh all right well go to bed <laughs> go to sleep. and uh yeah go to bed if, if it was me just so you know i'd already be in bed so. <laughs> yeah, i try i try to be most nights <laughs> yeah it's only nine o'clock here by the way i'd still already be in bed <laughs> well thank you very much for having me and thanks for the platform that you guys provide for everyone it's, Absolutely. it's amazing Best of the, luck, con Kevin. the content you, you guys are putting out is is top notch Thank you, man. Hey, make sure at the events you stop stop us if you yeah. see us walking around. And say hello. We'd love to visit with you and um, get to know you a little more. Yeah, well, I'm. Uh, I think I'm going to sign up for your guys' uh, coaching course that you guys are going to do. Yeah, we're I actually mean, j literally just about to talk about that. So, uh, <laughs> literally just about to talk. So that if you do want to sign up, there are only 18 spaces left. Uh, okay. So we it's been open a week. There's already 22 spots that are taken. Uh, so anybody who does want to sign up to the coaches clinic, you need to go to PB leagues, click on the Texas event link and the, the coaches show clinic is right there. You need to go get signed up if it's something you're wanting to do uh, because it will sell out. Um, and we are only going to take, I thought maybe about bringing in another coach and doing 60, but uh, I've since backed away from that. Cause I think Mike and I need to really, wrap our arms around the curriculum and do this first one with just 40 people, 40 people, by the way, is going to be a lot considering all the stuff we're going to talk about in two hours. Um, you will get a lot from it. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about event preparation, uh, structure, culture. Um, it's going to be a lot in two hours. So I hope people are, are engaged because if they're not, they're going to waste their money. And again, I know I've had some people were like, man, it's a little bit expensive. I'm like, no, it isn't. 
If you have 10 guys on your team, it's 20 bucks a guy for them to pay for you to come to this thing. And you're going to get better because they're there. So yeah. no, <laughs> it's not expensive, <laughs> yeah. right? It'll involve it's field actually, walking, play development, a lot of different stuff. So yeah. yeah. And we're going to give uh, more data sheets away. Like it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun and there'll be the, the, cohesion and synergy that happens when all of these coaches get together in in kind of one place right and we all get to sort of have those conversations is a it, it that's where really in my opinion the magic begins to to occur right where it's not just mike and i um just spewing information out it's when we we start to create conversation you know that's when things get really fun so Agreed. um yeah it's going to be a good time. So appreciate you signing up. And if you're going to, I would do it soon. Don't <laughs> wait. Sure I'll, do, I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, because like right now, I'm going to bed there's, right now. <laughs> there, yeah, there's 20, uh, again, before the show, there were 22 people signed up. And right now, none of them show paid, but they're all paid. Uh, oh, we're having a problem with the system. Imagine that PB League's having a little bit of an issue. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, so if anybody's wanting to sign up, get signed up. Don't wait. Unless yeah. you're going to bed, go to bed, then get up tomorrow morning and sign up. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and and thank thank you that that and thank people that Stuart Ridgel's not involved because he thinks two hundred dollars is too cheap. <laughs> Who is what's a Stuart Ridgel? I don't <laughs> like understand. Old, you know, he's like a virus. I don't understand what a yeah sounds like again something you should blow into a napkin. Stuart, love you, man. I absolutely love you to death. Thank you for your support uh, and uh, uh, your awesome friendship and. Why are you not with those two? He's got twin babies that should he should be holding right now. So he and Matt, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing you there, man. So the the uh, he's probably doing everything he can to get a moment or two to himself. If I was uh, <laughs> if I was a betting man, so well, he's got two they're, beautiful they're, children. They're few so. and far between once they show yeah. up. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I'm uh, blessed to be on the other side of that in my life. Um, I am, uh, my kids are out of my house, so I don't have to deal with that any longer. You know, I got a 21 year old and a 19 year old. And so no, no kids in my house. Yeah. I got a five year old and a one and a half year old and they definitely, they definitely keep you engaged. Oh my gosh, man. Oh my so gosh. So I put the link up. Can everyone see that? <laughs> yeah, and I actually just posted it too in, in both the things. So uh Stuart says he's gonna slap me. Buddy, I love you. I'm just kidding. I, let, I gotta let him <laughs> yeah. have that one. I'm just kidding, <laughs> pal. I love really you. Been kind of vicious to him tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Only because like I he's so good and he's so smart. He I have to every time I have an opportunity right to get one in on him, I gotta take it. I gotta yeah. take it. One of the best human beings I know. Devin, thank you again. God bless you. Best of luck to the Sea Dogs, and thank you to everybody that uh, that joined us tonight. Um, it yeah. was really insightful, and I love giving this opportunity. And maybe, maybe eventually Ryan and I are going to figure out how to start doing some stuff with some, you know, when we're breaking down the matches, we can actually show the shots and start. I'd love to have the marker like Madden. <laughs> Just start doing all the stuff and I draw all over the screen. We get oh, it'd be I'm, awesome. I'd eventually draw a clown though, and <laughs> be terrible. Mike doesn't know this yet, but we're actually we're gonna. Um, oh, I forgot to bring that up. If you want us to break down, I'm, Devin, we're gonna let you go to bed. Okay. <laughs> God bless you, Devin. Be safe, brother. Hey, buddy. Thank you. Hey guys, so for our next episode, so Mike and I actually are going to shoot it on Thursday and that'll be next Tuesday's post-production show. If there is a match that you would like to see us break down, either from Las Vegas, World Cup, really any match, even from last year, uh, that you would like us to pull in and break down, make sure to throw it in the comments. We'll come back uh, Wednesday evening. Uh, the 27th and kind of take a look at those because we will need time obviously to watch the match so we can put some ideas together. Uh, if there's a match that you want us to break down, uh, please, please, please put it in the comments. Then we'll look at some of those. If we don't think it's interesting, we're probably not going to break it down. Uh, but if it is, we'll do it, right? So um, D2 finals. Yes, that D2 will happen. D2 finals. That. Yep, <laughs> I bet you he happen. coaches one of those teams. <laughs> I know he does because you already said it. Uh, that will happen, Matt, for sure. And we'll get you on. Uh, maybe if Mike likes you, we'll get you on and see how that goes. Mike so, 
again, on the coaches clinic, it's also the sign up is in the uh, show description down below. So you guys can jump in there and sign up as well. Um, we'll post it again have, on our Facebook page. Um, oh, sure. Well, and there'll be some other media that will go out in the next couple of days. So uh, we'll keep reminding you guys until it's sold out and because then we're going to stop. But no, we want you to participate. We want you to be involved. So if you have some ideas on some, some matches that you want us to break down, please share them in the comments, send them to us on our Facebook page, whatever you need to do. And we're going to come back and look at those and whoever gets the most votes or seems to be the most interesting, we're going to go ahead and do that. So we really want you engaged. We really want your feedback because, Hey, we're doing this. Hopefully you're like us and you want to, you look for this kind of content. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Thank you, all right. Dylan. Thank <laughs> yeah, Dylan, that was awesome. Yeah. Uh, good. Appreciate all your feedback too, and glad you're uh, you're up in the chat, man. It's a big deal. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Coaches Show. Thank you to Go Sports for the use of your uh, your video. Uh, Major League Paintball for all the support for the show. Jake Jones for all the production work. Alex Sorensen, Kevin Fillers, and Tom Cole. Uh, this show has been brought to you by Max Sportswear. When needed, get maxed. I'm Ryan Gray with Mike Bianca, and as always, be responsible.